Guys, welcome back to the Perpetual Podcast, the first one of 2021. We're on episode 10 and also our first Zoom call. And I'm delighted to be joined today by... Brian O'Hengesa. Brian O'Hengesa. I actually listened to a podcast you were on quite recently. Um, I listened to it recently. You were on it ages ago. I'm on yeah. Adam's, on the Mastery Podcast. Oh, and yeah. I, re- I re-listened to him say your name two or three <laughs> times <laughs> just because I was like, I don't know how to say this. Um, Bear Brian, delighted to have you on here. Would you tell the listeners, the viewers, who you are, what you do, why do I want you on my podcast? Absolutely. I'll probably ask you why you want me on my podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure thing. So my name is, is Brian O'Hang. So I'm a nutritionist and a nutrition coach. And I have been in that role for, you know, a, a good few years at this point. Um, and I'm currently working with the triage method. Um, so I've, I'm the head nutritionist there uh, and head nutrition coach. So, um, yeah, I've been working with people on a one-to-one basis uh, for a good few years now. Um, very much a wide variety of clients working with their nutrition. But in, in recent times, it's become kind of a, uh, a niche in helping people with like disordered eating patterns, um, you know, get away, get away from like binge eating, uh, food anxieties, fear around different foods and that sort of stuff. So um, very much a mix of clients and, and I enjoy that, but that's, that's kind of what I've been pulled towards, I would say, um, more recently. Um, and, you know, aside from nutrition, I, I studied nutrition in uh, UCD, uh, got my bachelor's there. Uh, I've done the precision nutrition coaching courses um, and like, you know, I have interests in, like philosophy, as you know yourself, uh, similar to you. Um, and, you know, I, I enjoy training, uh, physical training all, of all sorts. Uh, we're saying there, I'm looking forward to getting back to the, the echo bike that's uh, in my sitting room. Uh, I'm not at home at the moment. But, um, yeah, uh, and I, when I can do jiu-jitsu, I do jiu-jitsu. But it's nice. been a long time, sadly, since we've been able to do that. Yeah. Um, so... Great. Yeah, that's that's who I am, and oh, oh yeah. We've got a fire alarm. I'm not ignoring it. It just keeps going off. Really, really sorry if it ruins the podcast here. Hopefully, phone will sort that out first. Um, so you're a nutritionist. First guest we've had on that is purely nutritionist. You don't do any in-person like coaching or training the same way that I would do at all? No, no, I've never uh, been one to train people or prescribe exercise programs. Um, Obviously I discuss it with my clients and it's something that I'm very much personally interested in and always have been. Um, And I'm very into training and fitness and that side of things. But yeah, never in in a professional capacity have I, coach someone wow. in, in exercise cool so, um so like you've mentioned there you, you you help people with fear of food and binge eating and would you say that then disordered eating would be your speciality or do you have a niche in that in that skill set or what's your yeah like it's kind of become uh, I suppose a, a, a primary skill set for me because um, there's, there's a lot of overlap and that sort of thing with like you know psychology of human behavior which is something I'm very interested in anyway and you know most of nutrition coaching is about behavior change uh, and there's, there's huge psychological aspects to it as opposed to me just saying okay James you eat this and then come back to me in a week and we'll see how you are like it yeah that, that would be fine. And there's a small subset of people that that works for, but it's not the majority of people. And it's not the people that I'm working with uh, necessarily. So yeah, it's, a, it's just something I've come across more and more and have had good results with it and a lot of success. And because of that overlap with my areas of interest, it's, it's, yeah, it's just become, and it's very, yeah. it's very, very fulfilling to help uh, people. I say it is, man. Yeah, break I say it free is. from that sort of shit. Um, so while I, well, they're not the only clients that I work with, like I work with athletes, I uh, work with, you know, gen pop, fat loss, um, obviously as a nutritionist, then I, I can advise on, on digestive things and uh, specific cases that can be resolved nutritionally. But yeah, that's that sort of yeah. area 
for disordered eating patterns um, and helping people with that is just, yeah, it's, it's where I've been drawn towards the, the last kind of year or two. Awesome. And so what, um, whenever you're coming or whenever these people come to see you and they want to work with you and say they have some sort of eating disorder, is there like a particular set of traits that they all tend to have or like, certain habits that they all tend to have and then you slowly help erode them away and replace them with new ones or is it very varied and it changes person to person yeah it's a good question and i think i think as time goes on and obviously the more people they work with you'll probably start to see patterns emerging um at the moment there's like a small number of say i would say categories or or templates that are sort of typical for how people end up in this position. So you may have somebody who is overly restrictive in their food selection um, for whatever reason that might be. So it's usually belief driven, you know, this list of foods are bad, therefore I don't eat them. And it's that sort of restrictive nature that leads them into disordered eating patterns and end up binging because um, they just go nuts then if they eventually break their diet. Yeah. Uh, uh, for people like uh, did air quotes there for anyone who's not watching this um so like that that's one major one uh another category would be people who use food as like a, as an emotional tool so to help them cope you know especially going through a pandemic like things are a lot more stressful uh you know emotions are higher and like the way i would describe that is you know if you open up a toolbox of coping mechanisms and how you get through these stressful periods in your life um, day to day. You know, if you open up your toolbox, eating is the main one that's there for, for these people. Yeah. And in that case, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a case of trying to give them more tools to use because, you know, eating, eating is not necessarily a bad tool to use, uh, you know, to make yourself feel better, essentially. Uh, it's, it's when it starts to have a negative impact on your overall life and your overall well-being. Um, that's another key category. And then generally there will be a large amount of say preoccupation with how they look physically yeah. themselves. So there will be like a disproportionate amount of self-worth tied up in physical appearance uh, yeah. for a lot of these people. And you know, that there, there can be many reasons for that. Um, you know, there's a lot of like, a lot of it is down to like history and past experiences and, you know, potential traumas drive a lot of this stuff. Um, but, but in that it's, it's trying to help people move away from focusing solely on physical appearance and like say yeah. body weight or whatever it is. And, you know, if you imagine like a pie chart, if like, physical appearance has taken up a huge chunk of their self-worth pie or the things that make make you up uh, it's trying to focus on other things so like you know what other things are important to you besides how you look um you know one of my colleagues you know uh, gary coined the or at least this is where i first saw it and i really like it as a quote but it's like your body should be the least interesting thing about you yeah. um you know for most people unless it's literally your livelihood unless you're yeah. you're like a bodybuilder or something okay fair enough but even still you want to be a more well-rounded human being than just having a set of abs right yeah or something i kind of spoke about on a podcast recently as well was you don't want to be the person that just talks about training and just talks about what they're eating on a day like if that's all you ever talk about no one wants to be around you anymore you should have other interests other aspects to your life that always add into that um just on that then, you kind of mentioned like the tools we use to help people get out of bad habits and whatnot. Like what have you used over the lockdowns to help you stay in a good place with your nutrition and not going overboard with stuff? Yeah, so for myself personally, um, like I think about this a lot. I think about like, you know, why, why do I seem to cope so well? And I probably overthink it in a lot of ways because... You know, one part of me thinks, okay, well, you're, you're very fortunate in the kind of position that you're in, in your life that you, you're, you know, maybe you don't have people that you're trying to care for, you know, I have a, a secure job because it's online. Um, 
So I'm not up against things like, you know, having to be at home uh, with my kids, um, either like out of a job or trying to work at the same time. Um, so like, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in a very fortunate position in a lot of ways, but then I also think that the way I try and push myself to perceive things allows me to cope pretty well. And like, that's where we get into like talking about the, the philosophy and, and stoicism and, and gratitude. So, you know, I will, I will, like, Chris, this is not going to be a good idea for everybody, right? Because you don't want to invalidate how you're feeling. Like if you feel, if you're feeling pretty shit today because of how things are, like you're not wrong to feel that way. Um, but you know, you asked me the question, how do I cope? So I'm, I'm always essentially thinking like how things could be worse. And I'm, I'm always exposing myself to accounts of how things are worse. So like I read a lot of stuff, uh, like about the Holocaust and, um, you know, like say man search for meaning, like that's, that's not an account of, uh, what it's like in a concentration camp. Like there's, there's other accounts of that, but just to keep that in mind, that's like, you know, shit, man, things could be a lot worse. Um, like, you know, I, I like and a good example for, for this whole pandemic. It's like, okay, well, if this is the kind of big crisis or that's in my sort of lifetime or right now, it's like, okay, well, I could be in a trench in, in a different era. I could be in a trench in France um, with, with people shooting at me with a very low chance of surviving that. And if, if it's a choice between potentially that or just having to be at home uh, in, you know, in a nice house and lots and like, you know, Netflix available to you and you can still do physical exercise. Um, that's a pretty good deal to me. So. Yeah. That's something I've spoke to a few of my clients about too. It's like, just because your problem is a first world problem doesn't detract from it. However, let's bring a back a step if it is becoming overwhelming and then recognize where things could be significantly worse. At least I still have a roof over my head, family that loves me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's trying to just recognize the problem, accept it, and then work out strategies around it. Yeah. Yeah. And like, like I said, I'm super conscious that a lot of people are in bad positions, like much worse positions that you or I will be in, you know, if you're at home and, you have an abusive partner or something like that and you're stuck with that all day like that's yeah. terrible and you know i have to be conscious of that and like everyone's individual situation is going to be different um but just to try and maintain that sort of perspective that you know try and be grateful for what you do have essentially and like yeah. you know, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of people having a gratitude practice like for myself for clients for everybody um because you take things for granted otherwise yeah. um and also within this, like, I think, and this is like where like physical training and stuff comes in so useful. Like, you know, obviously there's the mental health benefits to it, but also building that resilience yeah. uh, and kind of building that tolerance for discomfort. Um, and that's where- You're talking you know, my language, Brian. No, you're talking my <laughs> language. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. This is something I really push for my clients as well. So yeah, that's huge. Um, with the philosophy side of things, like how did you get into that and the stoicism and meditations and Marcus Aurelius and all that? Was that something you sought out or what was it? Um, I think I've, I've been asked this before and I've struggled to give the, the exact answer because I can't quite remember, but I'm pretty sure I was listening to the Tim Ferriss podcast <laughs> and uh, either he mentioned stoicism or maybe he was interviewing Ryan Holiday, who is you know the author of Daily Stoic and The Obstacle Is Away and those other books. Um, so I think that's where I first came across it. But I will say I have to hold my hand up and say that I probably like self-select into it just by my personality anyway. Yeah. Um, so I'm if if you're you know if you're that way inclined and you come across this, you're like, oh yeah, this is the best thing ever because you know because you relate to it. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I found it and, and, you know, I share the Daily Stoic a lot. And as a result, a lot of people uh, tell me on social media that, you know, oh, I saw you sharing that. There's a huge amount of interest in it, which is deadly. Um, and a lot of people pick up the book then and they're yeah. like, this is great. And it has that ripple effect, um, which is all. I love that. Like, yeah. uh, it's, I like nothing more than for someone to say, hey, you know, I 
saw the Daily Stoic on your story and I picked up a copy and, you know, it's, it's helped keep my head straight um, through difficult times like we're in now. So it, it's the kind of thing that nearly everybody, because it's very relatable philosophy. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's been around for, you know, a couple of thousand years, but it's, it's super, super. It's funny relatable. how it works, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yeah. Like, I, I reckon, I reckon you were the first person I seen shared as well. When, and so whenever I picked it up, it was after you'd shared a few days and I was like, this seems like, cause I'd read meditations and it'd be okay, yeah. like Seneca and a bunch of all different ones, but I never got into Ryan Holiday stuff and it was probably you that put me onto him. So thank you for that. You mentioned there, like you're a big proponent of gratitude and you, you suggest it towards your clients as well. Like, so what way do you, what way do you get people to buy into that? Because I've tried that and got a bit of resistance from it. So what are your strategies for that? Yeah. So what's, what's the resistance point usually for them? Would you say, um, where they, they struggle to recognize what things to be grateful for in a day. They're like, I just had a day. I just had a Monday, like nothing happened today. What could I, possibly yeah. right to be thankful for or they think sure. it's just some hippy dippy airy fairy yeah stuff. yeah so yeah for the people who say you know it's, it's kind of airy fairy um you can show them like the you can show them some scientific support for gratitude you know consistently increasing happiness and and, and maintaining that happiness increase because there's um there's this thing, I think it's called hedonic adaptation, but, you know, say if you go get, go and get a new car tomorrow, right? Your, your happiness increases by say 10% or something. Um, but as soon as you normalize to the fact that that's your new car, the, the effect kind of wears off. Um, and it's only then if you get another yet better car that you will keep that up. So it becomes kind of a hedonic approach or shoes or phones or new clothes or whatever the thing is yeah exactly but the the research on gratitude practice shows that um you get about a 20 percent increase in your happiness when you're doing it consistently and even in the studies like in some of the studies they only did it once a week um and so i'm, I'm obviously pushing people to do it you know every day if they can or five days a week but you know if if that helps develop buy-in and, and you say to your client, okay, I just want you to try it twice a week. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's can still have the benefits and, you know, so show the people that think it's airy fairy that there's scientific proof to say like, this can make you happier. This can make you sleep better. This can improve your tolerance to pain um, and all these other things. And then there are some common pitfalls, right? So th like you said, it's people are like, well, what the hell do I write about? Or <laughs> the one that comes up, the most I would say is like people become stagnant in their topics of gratitude. So it's, you know, I wake up in the morning and I say, I'm grateful for my friends, my family, and my health. And then I do that tomorrow and the day after that. And yeah. it could, it becomes stale very, very quickly. Um, so in that case, you need, what I, what I say is you need to get quite specific with the things you are talking about. So if you're great, if you, if you have been writing, say I'm great for my family. Okay. Well, who in your family, what about them? What experiences do you have with that person that you are grateful for? What have they done for you? Um, what can you do for them? This sort of thing. It doesn't always have to be something that's happened as well. It could be hypothetical. Um, and the same thing with any, any sort of relationships. Uh, you know, so, you know, the people in your life, like, don't just say you're grateful for your friends, like which friends, uh, which ones specifically, um, what fond memories or experiences do you have with that person? And, you know, you can cycle through a lot before you run out uh, yeah. when looking at it that way. And, you know, if you can build up some momentum with it and start to activate your reticular activation system. So where you, na you naturally become more accustomed to seeing things that you're grateful for, the little things, um, then you'll be able to more easily pick up those little things on a day to day basis. Um, so you can use that big stuff initially to gain some headway. And then you'll be more adapted to being grateful anyway. And then, you know, it, it's, it is kind of like a case of momentum. Once the, the object is in motion, it's a lot harder to stop it. Um, and yeah, so opportunities, any experiences. Um, so there's a lot of material to work with there. 
and then you know just and then also to have the emphasis that like it doesn't have to be uh big stuff either you know it, you know if someone if someone comes into work and they brought a coffee in for you like that's pretty pretty sound um you know that you can definitely use that as an option yeah. um and then to get people going on it i think uh a, a journal like a pre-designed journal that has like a template makes it a lot easier to get started Ask so the questions yeah yeah with the prompts so like the the five minute journal is the is the one that i started with and recommend the most there's a few kind of knockoffs of that so you just have to make sure it's it's the proper one so yeah. the one that's made by intelligent change um and that lasts for six months and then you know after that point i feel like you can just either create your own sort of template or just write in a in a blank notebook yeah, or a you get into that routine like that. of it anyway yeah that's average that's something i'll definitely apply and to those who are watching and listening like it's it's something well worth trying it can be very uncomfortable initially like writing down that you're grateful for whatever happened that day and then it's one of those things kind of like we mentioned earlier about perspective like eventually you go right this bad thing has happened to me but i'm glad it has because it set a chain of motion or chain of actions in motion and now i am here i am and this opportunity came out of it and it helps you flip that perspective by being grateful from the get-go as well doesn't it mm. lovely um something i wrote down and i don't know how much you're allowed to talk about this or whatever but you worked with jess who works in Provecha, jess yeah. armstrong yeah. yeah um and she raved about you like kind of going back to that nutrition stuff again is whenever it does come to things like disordered eating is it typically women that you see or men or do you see more women for this thing and more men for this thing or what's your your perspective on it yeah i think it's it's definitely more uh, common in women that, that i'm seeing this and i think the the overall like research data supports that that it is a women are more consumed by say body image issues and they're more uh, susceptible to like the effects of diet culture uh and things like that so i think i think it's more common certainly for a woman to be tied up to have her self-worth tied up in her physical appearance but yeah like at the same time men are not safe from it it's it's probably getting worse um you know in a way for men because there is more of a shift towards like a an ideal male physique now i think that than there has been in in previous points in time um so it's like you know to be more muscled and to to be leaner um that's that's more on people's on men's minds now than i think it has been in the past um and yeah and it's kind of a similar shift for women as well where it's like it's not just being skinny or, or thin anymore it's like you know have massive glutes but also have a tiny waist and also yeah, have yeah, uh, yeah. big boobs as well and then you know it, it's it's becoming harder and harder to achieve really um which is going to put more people in the in the situation where they're feeling like they don't compare and they're inadequate because of that yeah. you know um so you know I, i've definitely worked with men on these kind of issues um certainly uh, uh around especially around binge eating and stuff like that uh, but it is more so women because i think they're more yeah i think they're just i think they're just blasted with with diet culture yeah and uh the these body image ideals more than than men are but like it's it's both works both ways uh, both sexes are, are in the mix yeah yeah um so with you then personally like how do you balance because i follow you on instagram so i see everything so how do you balance like training your work your enjoyment of fine foods and fine wine and <laughs> still maintaining a physique that you're comfortable with and putting out an impression that people are still going to buy in and trust into you without losing like how do you balance it all i would balance everything yeah i suppose like like having like scheduling is is incredibly important so like yeah. you know every night generally i will do a daily 
plan of how I wanted to run. Um, and now it, it doesn't always go to plan naturally. And if, and then what, one major mistake that I'm sure a lot of kind of hyper productive people will make here is that they try and schedule like every fucking 15 minutes in the day. Yeah. And then as soon as you miss one thing or one or one thing that you're doing takes like thing goes, yeah. five minutes longer than you had planned for, then it all falls apart. So you need to have, give yourself leeway. So if I, if I am going to dedicate theoretically half an hour to a task, I will give myself 45 minutes. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively easy for me to keep training because I enjoy it. And it's important to me and it's part of my identity. Um, but at the same time, like I don't, I don't get stressed out if I can't train or if I have to miss a session because I'm busy because I think I've been doing it for long enough and I have that kind of broader perspective that, you know, missing a session here and there because I was maybe, you know, had a, had a bunch of work to do and that took the priority kind of accepting and having that knowledge of what your priorities are and how they may change. Uh, you know, day to day or year to year, um, you know, because I went through a period where I was working uh, a couple of jobs and doing that uh, precision nutrition level two course. So I, I had very little time to train. Um, so I, I was doing like two, maybe 20 minute sessions a week, which is like, wow. it's, pre it's pretty poor by my own standards. But I also didn't tell myself I'm a piece of shit because I don't train more often. I say, okay, look, you have these other priorities right now. Like this course is not going to last forever. Um, so you will get that time back. And while, while things are unfolding, just do what you can. So, um, you know, if it's, a, if it's a 20 minute circuit a couple of times a week, which is what I was doing, or an interval session on, on the assault bike, um, that's, that's infinitely better than doing nothing. Yeah. So I'm never like black or white or, you know, set unrealistic standards for myself and in doing so uh i can get a lot more done um and that ties into the the whole nutrition thing as well now that now that you remind me of it it's uh having perfectionist tendencies and standards really sets people back um when yeah. it comes to their food because because if you're not if you don't hit your targets perfectly and you set that bar too high then you are essentially failing every single day by your own standards, not, not anyone else's standards, or yeah. maybe you've inherited those standards from somewhere from misinformation or whatever it is. Um, but it doesn't feel good to fail constantly. And if that's going to be the case, you're probably going to give up or you're going to say, well, fuck this. And then you're going to binge and then you say, Oh shit, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, and I have to try harder. So then the bar sets is set even higher. Yeah. So it's very, very important to start where you're actually at um, without making any nutritional or lifestyle changes. I love it. That's something I preach all the time. And it's people tend to be all or nothing with if they're like that in their work and in their personal life, then they also bring it into their training and into their nutrition. And if they're supposed to train on Monday and they don't do it, the chances of them training the rest of the week is slim to none. And it's like, yeah, but you've just like, you've missed one day. Let's yeah. get back on track and go from there. So how then do you balance getting into like your nutrition because I know you like wine and I love wine, even though I'm doing dry January now, I don't miss it that much, but I do love it. Like, how do you bring that in without letting it completely derail you? Um, it's having that understanding of, you know, what boxes do I actually need to tick day to day or week to week with my nutrition and you know, what, how much is good enough? like instead of trying to be perfect what's actually good enough so it's like i'll have non-negotiables so you'll rarely find a day where i'm not hitting my protein intake and you'll rarely find a day where i don't eat at least a few servings of vegetables uh, <laughs> and, and fruit and like you know my, my standard for that is very very high so you know two portions of veg in a day is, is kind of low level by my own standards where i'm at now but i have to build up to that um and then, you know, when you can do that and you have that awareness of how your nutrition fits into a week or a month, instead of saying, I have to get it right today, because if not, then everything goes to shit. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm never doing anything excessively. So, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to go down to South Africa. I did not bring that 
strain back. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just, I will just say that because uh, I, I got te- I got tested, so I was clean, man. Um, just before people jumped down my throat. Blame you, that. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was there in uh, in November, and uh, man, the, like the the quality of food there and the standard of wine is exceptional, um, <laughs> and it's all very very cheap relative to you know what we pay here. Like obviously it's yeah. it's relative to income down there, but um, like you can get really really fine dining for you know half or a third of the price of what you wow. might pay here, or what I wouldn't pay here actually for it. Cause, like, <laughs> I wouldn't be bothered yeah. with it. Um, and yeah, that, that was five weeks away, but like at the same time, I hadn't been drinking a lot during the year before that. Like I'm not a massive drinker. Like, yeah, I like, I do like my wine, like, like yourself. Um, but under normal circumstances, let's say, uh, where I'm not down in the wine country, uh, <laughs> and it's not Christmas time. Like I might only have, you know, one or two glasses a week and, and that's about it. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm, I'm fine with that. And I, I suppose just the fact that I don't have like a huge emotional attachment to food or alcohol or anything. Yeah. It's like, I really, really enjoy it. But if you said to me, oh, you can't do that today. It's like, all right, fine. Okay. I have other things I can do. That's, that's cool. So, you brought up a point there and I had, I had written in my notes prior to this that I wanted to ask you about it. And you mentioned non-negotiables. So you mm. like, you have your protein and your veggies and stuff like that. What do you, specifically like what do you have for yourself so tell me about your veggie intake because i'm huge on that as well and my clients need to hear it from someone else apart from me how important it is and then for your clients and for the people you work with what do you set them non-negotiables or do you build into it or what way do you work with that yeah so first of all for for your clients um it's very important that your non-negotiables are individualized i suppose yeah. because you know what's what's non-negotiable for me vegetable intake is not going to be the same as what's it was is for somebody who's coming off you know a typical western diet that may be pretty much devoid of, of vegetables so yeah. uh, again that comes back to starting with where you're at because you know if i eat 10 servings of vegetables a day i can't expect a new client to have that as their standard and even be able to stomach it yeah 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 no the digestive <laughs> tract won't won't take that kind of uh, kind of a beating in in the first week but so it's going to be individualized and it's going to be personalized and it depends really on, you know, what their goals are. So it's like, you know, you, you, for someone who's maybe tracking their, their calorie intake and it's like, and they have a fat loss goal. It's like, okay, maybe the, the bare bones non-negotiable is to try and, you know, hit, stay within your calorie targets. And if your macro split is all over the place, that's not too big a deal. And um, maybe for food selection, isn't as uh, high quality as you'd normally want it to be. Maybe that's fine. Um, but again, you're usually looking this, looking at this across like a week um, or more. Like it's never like, yeah. ha- no, it doesn't ever have to be day to day. So, you know, it's like for training, it's like maybe your ideal is train five times a week, but maybe your non-negotiable is like, no, I'm going to get two sessions, like no matter what happens, yeah. um, you know, unless, unless heaven falls, like I'm getting those two sessions in. And then, for my own actual personal non-negotiables, then it's like, I'm going to be hitting, you know, 1.5 grams per kilo of protein per day. And I, I don't, I'm not tracking my food and I haven't for a while. I've spent a long time tracking my food. So I've got that kind of understanding, got yeah. the benefit from it. Um, I just, I wouldn't do it necessarily unless maybe I had some specific fat loss targets, like with a, a short end date. But even then I usually just, uh, <laughs> do you kind of take kind of the lazy option and like intermittent fast or like um narrow my food selection down so i kind of i'm just really full and i know what i'm eating um uh you know sleep is going to be a big big non-negotiable for me like kind of i want to say i learned the hard way i'm not gonna be dramatic about it but you know in when i was in college like i went through a year or well, no, a college year is no, nowhere near a full year. So uh, <laughs> one, one college year, yeah. you know, like people, you know, people, <laughs> people in college talk about that, but it's like, well, uh, a college year is like 24 weeks or something like that <laughs> um, of when you're actually in there. But, uh, you know, I, I was going on like five hours sleep a night because I, I had quite a significant commute and then uh, there were long days and I was like, oh, and I also wanted to keep training because I was like, no, I have to keep training. And like, you know, my training didn't go anywhere. Um, yeah. 
I was, you know, I wasn't as aware of calories back then. So I, I was eating too much as well. So I didn't, I didn't and ended up in worse shape and not any, you know, stronger or physically <laughs> yeah. fit because I was going on, you know, way too little sleep basically. So since then I've been a massive, massive proponent of the importance of sleep. And, you know, I do think it's like the number one thing that people yeah. could, could look at to improve their health and well being. So, you know, getting, getting seven hours of sleep at least is going to be a, a non-negotiable. And like, of course, like that doesn't mean that I never ever in my life get less than seven hours of sleep, but it's just like, that's kind of a standard that I've set for myself. Um, and then for vegetable intake, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not eating as much vegetables right now as I have in the past. Like when I peaked there probably a year or two ago, I was, I was probably hitting on like 15 to 20 servings of plants per day. So wow, between fruit and veg. Yeah, man, like I would, I would roast up a few trays of veg um, like a couple of times a week and, and I'd put them into Tupperware and each Tupperware was five servings and I would have one with, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Um, Savage. Plus whatever fruit I was having. Yeah. And maybe if I was having a, a soup or something, that's usually a good one to, to help get it in. Um, now, I don't, I don't think you need to have that many servings yeah. per day. But, you know, people should push up to probably like, you know, five to eight servings um, and more because it's, it's a rare case where you can have too much and, because, and like, you know, they contain a lot of nutrients. So vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients that are exclusive to the plants themselves yeah. um, that aren't classed as vitamins or minerals. Um, they're going to provide those. They're good for health. It's, it's fairly, con- there's not a lot of things in nutrition that are conclusive, but it's pretty conclusive that the people who eat more fruit and veg tend to be healthier, um, have less risk of, you know, chronic disease and things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, great source of fiber, which is um, very, very useful for, for health purposes, eating enough fiber. And it tends to be something that um, people don't eat enough of, generally speaking. Um, yeah. So eating more, fruits, vegetables is a great way to bump up your fiber intake. Um, you know, fruits really tasty as well. You know, it's sweet and uh, helps yeah. satisfy a sweet tooth. I definitely argue for the fact vegetables are very tasty if you know what How to do, do with them. them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause like, I don't, I don't fucking want overcooked like limp broccoli there. Steamed with... Brussels sprouts. Yeah. Like, I don't, yeah, no, I don't want all that plain stuff. Like, so that's why, yeah. like I said, I roast so much of my vegetables because yeah. you can, season that nicely with like some chili flakes garlic and um, balsamic vinegar um Ooh, i did some brussels sprouts uh last night so parboiled them and then put them in a pan with uh, cumin seeds with the, like a spray Ooh. of oil and mm. you know that's that's much much better and it doesn't take any more effort yeah and like you know enjoying your food is so um, is huge and then, and then obviously vegetables are so filling that for anyone who has fat loss goals, um, you know, it's, it's almost like a prerequisite, I would say, yeah. for having a successful time of fat loss, because one of the biggest limiting factors is going to be being hungry and then kind of, and then adherence slipping. Yeah. So, you know, I will say, you know, to most of my clients after a certain point, it's like, you know, it's pretty much a requirement that you're going to have to eat a certain amount of fruit and veg per day and eat enough protein um if you want to have an easy time with this uh, yeah. you know if if their adherence isn't good for example um so yeah yeah 100 percent. yeah what are your thoughts then you kind of mentioned it a little bit um on fasting like how often do you do that how often do you prescribe it to people or is it just something that you do occasionally yeah i i can use it as like it's another tool in the in the toolbox for working with clients so i'm not I'm never going to be pegged as any kind of guy. I'm, it's yeah. like, I'm not, I'm not the, oh, Brian's, you know, you're never going to hear someone say, oh, Brian's the intermittent fasting guy or Brian's the keto guy. Um, Brian's the, veg, know, the vegetable guy. Yeah, I'm the vegetable <laughs> guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The non-vegan non vegetable guy. Yeah, that, that's yeah. true. Okay. You caught me out there. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, it, it's a useful tool. Um, for a lot of people uh, for and like, you know, this is why your nutrition has to be personalized and individualized because it may work very well for you and it may not work very well for me or somebody else. And um, so it's about like saying like, look, okay, here are the, here are the options. 
this is what the intermittent fasting option might feel like and why it might be good and why it might not be so good for you as a person. Um, and if you like the sound of that, we can give that a try. So you're always trying to give people options um, and say, look, okay, I've had people in your position in the past. They've tried intermittent fasting. It's, uh, it's helped them manage their daily calorie intake because, you know, if they fast until lunchtime, it means that those meals that they have between lunch and dinner are more satisfying. So they might, and it's, you know, it's relatively easy for a lot of people to, uh, you know, skip breakfast, just stay hydrated, maybe have some coffee or whatever it is. Um, but it's not the case for everybody. So not everybody's going to be suited to that. Um, and, you know, I'll do different forms of inter intermittent fasting for people as well. Like, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a daily, you know, 16 hour fast, eight hour eating window. It could be yeah. once a week, a 20 hour fast. Um, so you can eat more normally for those six other days uh, because some people might prefer that than say like a, a consistent drop in calories across the whole yeah. week. Um, so it's just another tool and it's not something that I like love myself. It's just I kind of naturally end up doing it maybe. And you know, yeah. if I have like the last time I was kind of trying to lose weight or fat under pressure was like for jujitsu competitions. So, you know, I did like a two week pretty aggressive diet where, you know, I just, I just I skipped breakfast. So I was having lunch and dinner and then like maybe a snack mm -hmm. and I was being very, very diligent about my food choices. So it was like loads of vegetables, actually being conscious of my vegetables because I eat so many of them that they do contribute a significant amount of calories. Um, but you know, lean, lean protein, a lot of potatoes, uh, just because they're like the most filling of, of the starchy carbohydrates. Um, and you know, and for the sake of that two week stretch, I was, I was not by any means gonna be like, oh, I'd love just some like chocolate or I'd love some sweets yeah, now. You know it's like, on yeah, for the sake of two weeks, you know, I can I can stick with that. I was having chocolate protein milk, I think, so that was that's <laughs> yeah, very that enjoyable. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I do like there's quite interesting research uh, coming out, uh, sort of in relate to in relation to time restricted feeding. So it's not. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. So like all all time restricted feeding is intermittent fasting, but not all intermittent fasting is, is time restricted feeding. Yeah say um so time restricted feeding is is eating in a window but starting it earlier so it, it aligns with your circadian rhythms right. so it's like you know if you have your breakfast at eight o'clock then you're in the morning like your clock starts then and the aim is usually to try and with it, eat within at least a 12 hour window um and that's pretty manageable for most people like there's yeah. research done on eight hour windows ten, and 10 hour windows they're not as practical i don't think you know, if, you know, if you have your breakfast at eight, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to have your last meal at four. Yeah. And, and, Especially you know, if and you just work a regular nine to five, like you're kind of. Exactly. Like you're, you're likely going to come home and have dinner with your partner or your family or whoever yeah. else. Um, so it's not that practical and you have, and what's practical is much more important than what's optimal um, like for that. people. Uh, yeah. That's, that's one of my favorite quotes. Uh, you know, practical is greater than optimal, basically. Um, yeah. But but this this research is particularly interesting in relation to say shift workers because the idea is that it lines up with your circadian rhythm better. So, um, like in terms of say body composition, it's all kind of the same. Yeah. But you know, if you have five hundred calories at three a.m., the kind of metabolic effect it seems is not the same as if you had it at three p.m. Okay, because your your digestive processes are not supposed to, for the lack of a better term, be up and running in, in the middle of the night. So what you see is improvements in like blood sugar management, improvements in, in things like blood cholesterol. So no, none, of, none of that stuff is going to relate to, you know, how defined are your abs, but it's, it's relevant to health. Um, and as such, for people that I have working shift, um, where possible, we'll set things up so that they're not eating very much between about midnight and, and 5 a.m. Uh, yeah. to try and, and, and account for that. So, Savage. again, it's very individual and depends on the person. So, you know, we can work with time. them. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, if you, if you are going to have something in that, 
in the middle of the night, it seems like high protein foods are, are best. So low, lower fat and lower carbohydrate um, and high protein foods have the, the best overall effect. You so, go. you know, you might have some high protein fat free yogurt and you might have some, some berries or something with that. And that's, that's cool. Yeah. That's deadly. That's something I haven't really looked into and it's, we have a few shift workers in here, so that's definitely worth looking into more for me anyway. Mm. To finish up then, a couple of things for you. You mentioned roasting and you mentioned that you fry your Brussels sprouts after power boiling them. Mm. Would they be your, what are your go-to things to help people increase their vegetable intake? Yeah, so absolutely. Like the roasting is just, there's not there's anything special about roasting as such. It's just that it, it makes the veg taste a lot nicer. So, yeah. um, and it's, it's quite conducive to meal prep as well, which is helpful. So, yeah. you know, if you can get a big tray of mixed vegetables, you know, so I'll do like carrots, parsnips, um, broccoli, maybe cauliflower, uh, aubergines, courgettes, red peppers is very important actually for the flavor because uh, roast yeah. red peppers taste great. Um, yellow peppers, um, kale, mushrooms, like all that stuff. You can just get into a tray. Uh, some of that stuff cooks faster than the others. So it can be like, Carrots and parsnips go in first, and then 15 minutes later, maybe the rest goes in. Yeah. Um, and then like a total cook time of like half an hour. But you know, um, you know, putting some olive oil on that, either pouring it or a spray, um, and then you can season it. Like I was saying, so one of my favorite favorite recipes is uh, chili flakes and balsamic vinegar and plenty of garlic. And nice. I'm happy to just eat that for a lot of meals. Um, so that comes under kind of like food preparation to make it easy to do because then once that once those trays are made and um, provided you have the space to store them like it's the easy option to have that um, and sometimes i'll blend up the the tupperware like put it into a blender and just make soup out of it and um, nice. if i want a bit of a change or you can make soup yourself Super. um soup is very very easy to do in a in a like just generally but in a slow cooker like i use a slow cooker a lot uh, as you probably know yeah um and you know if you if you have a big pot of soup there and you can say okay i'm gonna have a bowl of soup with like every meal or two out of three meals or whatever it is yeah, um, easy veg. trying to sneak veg into like composite dishes like you know bolognese or chilies curry stews because if you can do that which which you can like it's very easy to cram a lot of veg in there um and then if you can also prepare some veg on the side then you're getting you're getting a lot yeah. uh of veg by the time you get around to a meal and then um another key one would be making like smoothies so if you make a smoothie with it which is like half full of spinach leaves um and then some fruit and, and protein powder or whatever else you might have um those are some easy ways to, to get more veg in and i think yeah i think people like you know you can you can essentially steam broccoli in less than three minutes in the microwave like if you yeah. put it in a bowl uh, obviously chopped and then put in a bowl with a little bit of water and cover it like and, and microwave for two to three minutes uh, it's basically ready to go yeah. um you can you can wilt spinach if you pour boiling water over it into like a colander and and that's that you've yeah, cooked you vegetables in about 10 seconds in that case <laughs> yeah. um and that's something i'll do a lot because convenience is important as well yeah um, and having say yeah. frozen veg in the freezer to just try on the That's microwave backup option as well. If you, yeah, if, if you, you know, if you haven't done the shop or something, um, or you're stuck, it's like, Oh, okay. I can, I can still do this because I'm prepared in that sense. Love it. What about then philosophy? What would be your recommendations for your go-to if someone's interested in it, but doesn't know where to start? Um, yeah, I, like, I think like, obviously there's more to philosophy than just stoic philosophy and stoicism. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm trying to read more broadly, in philosophy now as well um but that's that's always going to be my baby i think and yeah. uh, you know it's a great blueprint for living and helping you deal with with life and having good perspectives and yeah. being a good person and all that all that important stuff um so i think the daily stoic uh, the book like it's you know the format is that you read one page a day makes it very very accessible to people and um, it's not expensive it's usually around 10 euro or less it's about 10 euros, yeah. um and then I think Brian Holiday's other, other books about Stoicism are quite accessible too. So yeah. The Obstacle is the Way, Ego is the Enemy. Um, 
I suppose stillness is the key uh, counts in that as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think start with the daily stoic and, you know, let that, and then, you know, podcasts and things can, yeah. can be good and let that foster kind of a, an interest in it. And, you know, you know, you don't need to put yourself under pressure. You don't have to read the, the primary texts. Like yeah. there's no bonus points really for it. Like I know part of my ego is definitely like, yeah, you're going to sit down you're going to read Nietzsche's entire works. <laughs> uh, and then your head explodes. <laughs> yeah. yeah but you don't you don't have to do that like yeah. it's it's whether the shit actually makes your life better or not like it's yeah. it's it's no bonus points being like oh yeah i read i read all those works and that's it i've read no them yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and then last one what would be your top wine recommendation okay so i will i will have to admit right uh james that because I've been fortunate enough to go to South Africa a few times and I have family down there, which is why. So my, my wine palette is very narrow to <laughs> South Africa. Okay. Um, Perfect. But I am getting in like, and obviously I like other wines. I like Spanish and, yeah. and French wines and stuff, but um, I take the most interest in wines when I'm in South Africa, but uh, I generally like uh, a Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, nice. The best wine that I had when I was down there this time that, and I brought a bottle back was the, the Constancia Glen number three. So that's a, that's a red blend. I definitely have a preference for red. Yeah, um, me too. So that's a, that's a very specific, you know, you want the vineyard and you want which bottle. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm going to say is my favorite wine right now. I love it. That's <laughs> a great answer, man. I love how excited you got about answering that question as well. <laughs> that was perfect. Brian, uh, that was... Um, great for me. Yeah. That was absolutely <laughs> deadly. Um, where can people find you on the socials, on the interwebs? What's your tags? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly active on Instagram, as you know. Uh, mm. So that's at Brian O'Hengisa. Uh, I'm sure you check the show notes for the spelling, but it's B-R-I-A-N-O-H-A-O-N-G-H-U-S-A. <laughs> um, you can find out about the, the services that I offer in terms of nutrition coaching at um, triage method.com um and there's, there's a tab for nutrition coaching where you can just do forward slash nutrition coaching that's linked on my instagram page as well so um nice. and then and then you know the triage methods instagram page um is a good resource too so yeah those are the main places to find out more and um Superb. yeah feel free to reach out anybody who is watching or listening to this definitely highly recommend it brian thanks a lot man Great having Thank you, you for having me, James. I will uh, chat to you soon then. Yeah, chat to you soon, my man.